this is this is still a good kind of chalk on, on the meeting. Um, the other kind of chalk is chalk I get in the Japanese restaurant. Um, all right, so identical particles. Um, this can be a confusing subject. Um, and I think the, the clearest treatment that I know of is in a book by Cohen Tanuji. And uh, so I, I'm going to follow that treatment uh, up to a point, and then I'm going to add some stuff that are uh, my own thoughts on it uh, in two places, in the middle and then at the end. Um, So the idea is that as far as we know, all electrons would say all electrons would spin up are exactly the same. Now that may not be true, but as far as we know, it is. And um, all helium atoms in the ground state. Yeah, good question. Yeah, when you say spin up, are you with respect to a particular axis? Okay, but then. There can be any direction, right? Right. So um, the electron that spin up isn't identical to the electron that spin down. But why couldn't you have like a spin one Y? If you're. Yeah, all right. So electron spin Y is not the same as electron spin X. Okay. But you can rotate one to the other with a suitable magnetic field and so on. Too. Um, or at least uh, you can have a beam that you can select. Anyway, um, so all helium atoms in the ground state are identical. On the other hand, if you have a gas of helium at very high temperature, some of them are going to be in the excited state, and so they're not all going to be identical. Um, in fact, that leads me to wonder about some of the applications of identical particles, um, especially to high temperature physics, because um, you know, at high temperatures, the atoms and even the nuclei would be in different states, and um, so they're no longer identical particles, and uh, whatever the statistics are they started with would apply at very high temperatures. Anyway, uh, I don't know if anybody's uh, pursued that. Uh, theoretically experimental. But um, so the idea is that how to, uh, the idea is that we have particles that are identical and the question is how to treat them. And let me let me describe first of all the kind of the the the, the problem. Let's let's think about electrons and uh, have the and we can think of uh, an electron one is spin up, and um, electron two is spin down, and uh, that's that's one state. But then there's another state that's uh, electron one spin down, electron two spin up. And since the particles are physically identical, these are two. These two states describe the same physics, really, and that's called exchange degeneracy. I don't know why the word degenerate and degeneracy is used so much in, in physics, at least in quantum physics, but it is okay. Now these states can form a space, alpha plus beta. And um, so that's a whole space of states, and the, that would be normalized as long as alpha squared plus beta squared is equal to one. All right, and now, now let's consider the uh, probability of measuring for this system, measuring uh, both particles having spin in the x direction. Now the spin in the x direction, you'll remember, is 1 over root 2. Whoops, I 
of x instead of plus. For a single spin, it is plus, plus, minus. And um, we can actually, if you want, uh, I can show you how to derive that. That is a rotation. If you take a plus in the z direction and you rotate the state about the y axis um, in a uh, right handed way by 90 degrees, then it comes there. So this is equal to e to the minus i pi over 2 um, uh, sigma over 2. It would be h bar, and then, in other words, h bar sigma over 2 divided by h bar, so the h bars cancel, um, times uh, the state 1, 0, or effectively, well, yeah, I'm, I'm switching. These are two different notations here, of course. Um, plus is 1, 0, and minus is the same thing as 0, 1. And um, if you expand that, which would be cosine of um, pi over 4 uh, minus i, uh, well, this is sigma y, minus i sigma y sine pi over 4. And um, so, um, that should give that number. Um, it's cosine of pi over 4 is, I guess, 1 over root 2, right? So this is 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2. And um, minus i gives us a minus 1 here and a plus 1 there except for the 1 over root 2. And acting on that with 1, 0 gives us indeed exactly this state here. So is, is that, does anybody want to see any more detail? In any event, by the way, when you do this kind of uh, uh, rotation trick to get the eigenstates of sigma x or some other sigma, um, you get them to within an arbitrary phase because any eigenstate is only defined within an arbitrary phase. All right, so what is this probability? Well, the state would be 1 over root 2 um, uh, the state 1 plus plus 1 minus direct product with 1 over root 2 um, 2 plus plus 2 minus. And so now if we take the inner product of that with this state, um, what are we going to get? Well, we're going to get a 1 half, certainly, from the 2, 1 over root 2s. And then, um, for example, we'll have, let me multiply this out. So it's actually the state will be the state plus plus um, plus minus plus 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 minus. Whoops. Onto this alpha um, plus minus plus beta minus plus. So this would be the um, the inner product, and this would give us um, one half alpha plus beta, and so the pro that, so that would be the amplitude. So the probability of um, plus in the x direction, plus in the x direction, would be uh, a quarter alpha plus beta squared. And so that depends, in other words, upon the alpha and the beta. And uh, as you then 
swing around this state, this space of degenerate, exchange degenerate states, all of which represent the same physical situation, you're going to get different probabilities for um, measuring uh, both spins to be in the x direction. So in other words, the, up, the bottom line is that this exchange degeneracy isn't just some mathematical curiosity, it has physical significance. Yeah. How do you get two electrons in that state? How do you get two electrons what? In that state. The state y1? Or xx, you mean? Yeah, just in general. Well, I, I, I guess, from a theory but um, I guess what you, you, first of all, you know, the way people did this in originally was they talked about electrons attached to atoms, and in particular they were using silver in very early experiments. By the way, you were right about neon, it was the inner shell of sodium is neon. Um, So one way is to attach them to atoms and uh, send the atoms through something like a stern gerlach apparatus where the, uh, uh, where the magnetic field points in the x direction. And on the other hand, we're talking about two electrons. And um, Um, one, I'm not sure quite how we do this, I mean, but um, you'd have to pick up a suit. You might do it with three electrons, but it would, um, I understand those experiments are very hard. So anyway, let me, let me let me beg off on the on how we do this. All right. I, um, I'm not quite sure how we do this, but it's at least plausible that we could do this or something equivalent. Does, does anybody have a good idea on how to do it? Well, let's leave let's leave that aside. And of course, this exchange degeneracy presumably only gets worse when you have three particles or four particles or. Uh, 100 particles, then of course if you're dealing with something that's um, macroscopic, then you have something like Avogadro's number of particles, and that's like 10 to the 24th, is it? Does anybody remember 10 to the 24th, 10 to the 26th, 10 to the 23rd, maybe? Anyway, big number, I think it's 60 to the 23rd, but I don't remember. Alright, so. So the question is, um, what, what, how do we choose these alpha and beta? And um, Cohen go through, uh, goes through a, he and his co-authors go through a, um, well, some of this is probably worthwhile because um, even though it's somewhat mathematical, um, First of all, if we have a state one, um, particle one in uh, the state, say, uh, ui, and particle two in the state, say, uj, um, and we call this then uh, one ui, two uj, like that, um, this thing is the same thing as two uj, one ui, which is then, um, say, two uh, uj, comma, one ui. So um, that's the tensor product notation that, that most people use. Now we can define a permutation operator, p21, say, on one ui, two uj, and what this does is it just turns this one into a two and the two into a one. Like um, like that. And uh, then 
we can rewrite that as 1UJ, 2UI. So you can think of it as either changing the numbers or changing the state labels. So this is a permutation operator. And more generally, if we had, say, P21 on a state 1, R, and spin epsilon to R prime epsilon prime, then this would be 2 R epsilon 1 R prime epsilon prime. And that would be the same thing as 1 R prime epsilon prime 2 R epsilon. So we're labeling these particles by 1 and 2 so that we take the right unit products. Now, we can imagine state psi, for example, that would be a sum over epsilon, epsilon prime, an integral P cubed R, P cubed R prime. Then we have psi, so epsilon, epsilon prime, and R, and R prime. And then on 1 R epsilon, 2 R prime, epsilon prime. So this is sort of a general state in this space. And if we apply P21 on the state psi, what we get would be this sum, the integral. And we get the same function, epsilon, epsilon prime, R, R prime. And then we get 2 R epsilon, 1 R prime, epsilon prime. And we could rewrite that as 1 R prime, epsilon prime, 2 R epsilon. And now, since R, R prime, epsilon, epsilon prime are dummy variables, they don't care what we call them. We can change their names. So we can interchange epsilon and epsilon prime, R and R prime. And then we get some integral P cubed R, P cubed R prime, psi, epsilon, epsilon prime. No, psi, epsilon prime, epsilon, R, R prime, R, 1 R epsilon, 2 R prime, epsilon prime. So you can think of this permutation operator either as acting, either as permuting the state of the number labels, or permuting the state labels, or changing the wave function so that psi, epsilon, epsilon prime, R, R prime goes to psi, epsilon prime, epsilon, R prime, R. So that's a mathematical manipulation that occurs often in physics. And it's worth thinking about for a moment, even apart from the subject of identical particles. Now, you can show rigorously that these operators, P21, is permission. You can also show that obviously P21 squared is 1. And since it's permission, then it is its own inverse. But its inverse is its adjoint, so it's also unitary. P21 adjoint is P21 inverse. So these transposition operators have all these properties. Now, we can then go on and define things. We can say that a state such as P21 on psi S is psi S. We can call this symmetric. And then we can say P21 on psi A minus psi A. And this would be anti-symmetric. And the operators that do this are S equal to 1 half, 1 plus P21. We're still in the space of two particles, two identical particles. And A can be a half or minus P21. And you can see that these are both permission. And you can 
show various other properties. I don't know if we need to show all of them. But what you can show in particular is that P21 on S side is equal to S side, and P21 on A side is equal to minus A side. So S and A are respectively operators that symmetrize or anti-symmetrize an arbitrary state. Okay, now, what about observables? Well, if you have, for example, an operator of some kind, then P21 on, say, an operator B1, P21 adjoint, so this is sort of a unitary transformation, although since the thing is remission, it's somewhat artificial. That on one, say, the state, part of the one in the state UI, two in the state UJ, this would be P21, P1 on, now it would be, if I do both tricks, then this is one UJ, two UI, and then this would pull out, say, the eigenvalue BJ, this is the state J, so B is the value J, part of the one has the value BJ in this state, and then we have P21 on one UJ, two UI, and then this flips it back, BJ becomes one UI, two UJ. So that's, that is to say then that P21, B1, P21 adjoint is effectively B2. And so I want to play various games with this, and what you can then say is that if you have an observable then that acts on, that's composed of, say, B1 and B2 in some way, and if that commutes with this, then you can say that the observable is symmetric. And in fact, that's what you expect. You expect that physical observables commute with all the permutation operators, because particles are identical, and so it shouldn't matter whether a particle is particle one or particle two, and so forth. And let me see, just an example, let me just throw up an example. So the particles are identical, they have the same mass, they have the same charge, they have the same spin, and so a Hamiltonian might be P squared over 2M, P1 squared over 2M, plus P2 squared over 2M, and then plus maybe a repulsive potential, R1 minus R2. And so what you see is this thing is entirely symmetric under the operation of this P21H, P21 adjoint is just H, and the same thing is the, remember we saw that the total angular momentum could be written as R1 cross P1 plus R2 cross P2. This thing is also symmetric under permutations. Notice, however, that R1 minus R2 is not symmetric under permutations, and that's why that doesn't occur in Hamiltonians. Instead, you only see the absolute value, and it's over here. All right, well, you can generalize this business of these permutation operators. Obviously, you can have, for example, if you have three objects, you can have P1, 2, 3. You can have P3, 1, 2, P2, 3, 1, P1, 2, 2, P2, 1, 3, P3, 2, 1, for example. 
these are the six elements of the permutation group on three objects. These are six permutation objects. And for example, P231 on the state 1UI, 2UJ, 3UK is going to be 2UI, 3UJ, 1UK. And then you can rewrite that as 1UK, 2UI, 3UJ. That's another way of writing it. These permutation operators form a group. The product of any two permutations is another permutation, obviously, because if you scramble once, you scramble twice, or then you scramble, which is what a permutation is. And now, what can you do about it? What can you tell about these? It turns out that these three guys are odd. Why is that? Because they involve a single transposition. OK, the first one involves a 3-2 transposition. The second one is a 1-2. And this is a 1-3 transposition. On the other hand, these guys are even. And that's because they involve no transpositions or two transpositions. And OK, so that's called parity of a permutation. The parity of a permutation is, I guess, minus 1 to the n, where n is the number of permutations. And this is something I forgot to mention. You can write any permutation as a product of transpositions. And so, for example, p1, 2, 3 is the product of zero transpositions. So n is equal to zero. p, as I said, p1, 3, 2 is just p, 3, 2. This guy is a little harder. p3, 1, 2 I'm guessing that it's p2, 1, followed by p, it's something like this. But this may not be exactly right. This may be all by a sign. Or it may be wrong. But anyway, you can write it as a product of two transpositions. Let me see. No, unfortunately. Yeah, all right. Let me, well. Yeah, all right. p, yeah. Another way of writing it, so this may or may not, what I wrote may or may not be right. But what certainly is true is it's a product of p1, 2, 3 times p2, 1, 3. This one, as I said, was a transposition of 1 with 2. And this is a transposition of 2 with 3. And so you can write it this way. But these decompositions are not unique. It can also be written as p2, 2, 1, p1, 3, 2, and as various other things. And all of these permutation operators are unitary. But when you get away from transpositions, they're no longer permission. And the next thing is just to think about a, this minus 1 to the n, I'm going to call epsilon. That's the parity of the permutation. So it's either positive or negative, plus 1 or minus 1. And remember, we had a symmetrizer over here, which was way back here, 1 half, 1 plus p2, 1, 1 half, 1 minus p2, 1. The generalization of that to n permutations is that s is 1 over n factorial. And n here is the number of objects. 
sum over all the permutations, that permutation, and the anti-symmetrizer is 1 over n factorial, sum over all the permutations, the parity of the permutation times the permutation. And so you can see that S and A are remission. And OK, so all right, so those are useful. Let me now get to, I'm going to now deviate from the, from Cohen-Tanuji, because I think I have a better way of describing this thing. At least for the case of two spin one half particles, two spin zero particles, two spin one particles. All right, let's, let me say what, how I think of this symmetrization postulate, which is, which is what we all know about, namely that you, you remove this, you use the symmetrization operator to remove the exchange degeneracy if your system, if your particles are bosons, identical bosons, you use A to remove the degeneracy if your particles are identical fermions. So the, so if you have a state that's the state of fermions, you have P, I'm sorry, you use A, the anti-symmetrizer, on the state of fermions, and this will be a physical state. So this is the physical state. And you use S on the side of the boson, and this is, again, the physical state. And so in particular, in that example up there, you would have beta equal to alpha for bosons and beta equal to minus alpha for fermions. So for the example, you have alpha, alpha, well, since they're electrons, is the way I was thinking of it, you'd have beta equal to minus one, and so you'd use this state, and then you'd normalize it to the one over root two. So that's the application. Now let me say, give you a different way of thinking about it. And the idea is that you use the operators of the theory to make a state that doesn't distinguish between the particles or among the particles. And so if you have, for example, a state where one, particle one is at position X and it's been up, and particle two is at position, say, minus X and it's been down, then what you want to do is you want to produce this plus, and now a physical operator that turns this into the other state. So in other words, the other operator, I'm going to call it U on one X plus two minus X down. And let's think what that operator would be. The operator, if you had one particle here is X spin up, or let's do it simply with both spin up to start with, because this would be simple. So one is at position X spin up, the other one is at position minus X spin up. Now what can you do to flip this around to the other kind? Well, you can do a rotation about the Z axis by angle pi. And so you say you take this state, 
which I can only abbreviate it as X plus minus X plus plus E to the minus I pi, and it would then be sigma Z over 2, acting on, and this would be sigma 1Z plus sigma 2Z, acting on the state X plus minus X plus. And so what this gives you is a factor of minus I in both cases. It would be, in other words, E to the minus I pi over 2, sigma 1Z on 1 plus is going to be simply E to the minus I pi over 2 on 1 plus, and actually I lied, it's minus I, so this is minus I of the state 1 plus. On the other hand, E to the minus I pi over 2, sigma 2Z on 2 plus is then the same thing, E to the minus I pi over 2, 2 plus, and I left out the X, so this 1 is at X, and instead of using sigma, we also use L, so it's minus I pi LX, LZ plus L1Z plus L2Z. So we're rotating the whole thing, so this should be stated as 1X plus goes to, I was just doing the spin part here, so it's 1 plus times E to the minus I pi L1Z on X, and altogether then this gives us minus I minus X, 1 in the state, minus X plus, and if we do the same thing on this one with minus I pi L2Z, and this is the state 2 minus X, minus X plus, then this will give us 2X plus. So in other words, which is to say minus I 2X plus, okay? The result of this then is that this state is 1X plus 2 minus X minus plus, and now minus I times minus I is minus 1, minus 1 minus X plus 2X plus, okay? So in other words, if you prepare the state in a symmetrical way using a physical operator, then the fact that this is spin 1 half gives you the correct sign here. Okay. So you might say, well, what about the case plus minus? Or obviously the case minus minus works the same way. With the case minus minus, you just have two factors of I and you still get the minus sign. So you get as your physical state this, although of course you have to normalize it correctly with a 1 over square root of 2. So the normalized state is 1 over 2 times X plus minus X plus minus minus X plus X plus. So now we can think about, well, suppose these things were spin 0 particles. Well, if they were spin 0 particles, then we would, we would, we wouldn't need the spin operator at all. We'd just use the orbital angular momentum to generate the rotation. And in that case, we would have 
x minus x plus this u on x minus x. And this would just give us x minus x plus minus x, x, which we then normalize to 1 over 2, x minus x plus minus x, x. Now, the tricky case is suppose we started with, say, a plus here and a minus there. All right, so let's think about what the physical rotation has to be there. So this is the one that I started with and changed. So let's make it x plus minus x minus. So now, instead, now, as the rotation about the z-axis won't work because it'll take the spin plus over here. Wouldn't that work? Wouldn't that work? Because you do that and then flip the spin of the operator. Let's see. Let me just, what we have here is x plus minus x minus. And what we know we want as our answer, luckily we know what the answer is. We want minus x minus comma x plus. So that's the thing that we want divided by square root of 2. And so if we rotated this around, I see it wouldn't work. And you were going to suggest what? Couldn't you rotate it and then do it about y? Or no? That may work. That may work. But let me tell you, I've done this problem before. So I'll tell you what the answer is. Suppose you rotate about the y-axis. If you rotate about the y-axis now, you're going to bring minus x minus. See, this spin is going to be down. And then when you rotate, so it's going to look like this. It's down. Now when you rotate it about the y-axis, it's going to be up. So let's just check that. E to the, and let's say it's a right-handed rotation. E to the minus i pi sigma y over 2. Let's just see what this is. Well, this is cosine pi minus i sigma y sine pi. And of course I got it wrong. It's pi over 2. Now cosine pi over 2 is 0. Sine pi over 2 is 1. So this is minus i sigma y. And this is just 0 minus 1, 1, 0. So in fact, this is, we have the following. We have e to the minus i pi, I'll write it differently, sy over h bar on the state plus, well, it would be effectively 0, 1, minus 1, 0 on 1, 0. And this would just give us 0, 1, which is the state minus. On the other hand, e to the minus i pi, sy over h bar on minus then, would be 0, minus 1, 1, 0 on 0, 1. And this would be minus 1, 0, which is minus plus. So this is the minus sign. And we've got a minus sign over here because we have two factors of i or minus i. Over here we get a minus sign because of the rotation about the y-axis. If we get it for one of the states, but not, we get it for the minus state, but not for the positive state. So the orbital angular momentum, so in other words, we, we act on the state e to the minus i pi j y on the state um, x plus minus x minus 
And that gives us then minus minus x minus x. Oops. X plus. Which is what we want. And so the rule then that you take the original state, x plus minus x minus, and add this unitary transformation, but this physical transformation using the operators of the theory, x plus, I suppose. This gives us then x plus minus x minus 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 x minus x plus. And if we normalize it, we get 1 over root 2. So in other words, one way of stating this rule for the symmetry of identical particles is to say you simply take the state, and then you do a physical operation that interchanges the two particles. And that gives you the correct sign and permutation. And of course, if these were bosons, then the sign wouldn't have occurred if they were spin 0. If they're spin 1, so let me discuss spin 1 for a second. But there must be a question here. I like this way of doing this. I don't know. Because you see, the normal way when you discuss this in the text, it's just written as a postulate. Although in quantum field theory, you can derive it in some different, but in ways that aren't very much different. OK, suppose we have spin 1. And now we have, again, suppose x. And now we have m, comma, minus x, m. Or just to make things concrete, let's make this a spin 1 particle. Let's just say it's a massive spin 1 particle, so we don't have to fool around with the fact that the mass of this particle only has two polarizations. OK, so what would the rule be here? It would be this plus the unitary transformation on x1 minus x1. And the transformation would just be a rotation about the z-axis. So this would be x1 minus x1 plus e to the minus i pi jz on x1 minus x1. Well, now the orbital angular momentum part is just going to turn x into minus x and minus x into x, because it's a rotation about the z-axis. So we've got particles originally here, minus x1, rotates them like that. The rotation, on the other hand, about the z-axis is going to give an e to the minus i pi for both of these guys. But that's a minus 1 for both of these guys. But minus 1 times minus 1 is 1. And so the answer is that this is equal to x1 minus x1 plus minus x1 x1. And so then we take this and divide by 2. So for bosons, you see, because this, in other words, e to the minus i pi, and I'll just write s sub z on 1 is just e to the minus i pi 1, which is minus 1. But this occurs on both this one and that one. And so you get two factors of minus 1. Clearly, if they're both spin down, you get plus 1 twice. And so plus 1 times plus 1 is plus 1. And on the other hand, 
you have uh, plus minus, well then, um, you need to do the trick with the rotation about the y-axis. Um, there's also the possibility, though, of if it's a mass of particles from one, you can have zero, zero. And then you just look here about z, and there's no problem. Um, um, so, has that been zero, like a linear combination of the one and a minus one? No, no, no. Well, what we've got so here is um, we've got one, zero, zero, oh, zero, okay. one, zero, and zero, zero, one. So I'm, I'm using so they're that all basically. like in their own subspace or something. Right. No, I guess. I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but but the here I'm talking about a spin one particle, so the in other words, J squared on J M here is H bar squared times one times two times J M and J three or J Z on J M is um, H bar M J M and here M is less than or equal to J less than or equal to minus J. So it runs from minus one to one. Okay. Well, I think one can work these out for other cases, such as uh, one zero and plus and minus and so forth. Um, the plus and the plus one and minus one um, can work the same way as doing this rotation about the y-axis and. Um, uh, that would again turn uh, something that was, um, say, spin down into something that was spin up, and something that was spin up into spin down. Uh, the question is, what are the factors? And um, for that, we need the um, rotation matrix in the basis uh, in which JZ is diagonal and. Um, I forget what that is. Maybe I'll assign that as a little more problem. One of the reasons, by the way, why I went through this is I think it's a nice review of spin, as well as um, an ex I, I, I think it's a, it's a partial explanation of why it is that, um, that these uh, that the you use the anti symmetrizer for fermion fermions and the symmetrizer for bosons. All right, so let me erase some more of the board and then um, continue on with Kantanucci's shooting. I believe that one can generalize this completely, um, but I haven't done it. Obviously, there are infinitely many cases and to do each of them by hand is, um, is there any sort of insight as to why Fermions behave the way. Well, I think you're getting it from this. I thought we postulated that. Well, I, yeah, I, what I, no, no, no. That's the standard thing people do. What I'm saying you should do is you postulate that you take a linear combination of, in the case of two particles, the state and then an operator acting on the state that permutes the two particles. And that physical operator on the first state will give you a minus sign or a plus sign. That's the idea. So that, that's, that's what I'm saying. Is a, I don't know if it's in the literature. It might be somewhere. I've never seen it. Anyway, that's how to remove the exchange for the matter, see, and And it associates, I mean, it gives you one rule, and then the, the, the physics of the, the mathematics of the spin then gives you the correct association between fermions and bosons. All right, let me get back to, to Komatanuji's treatment, which is pretty good. Um, 
language looked to be precise and quite often in the language. All right, so recall, let me just say then, the generalization of this to n particles is that what you would do is you would start with your states, for example, 1, u, i, 2, u, j, let me just do 3 particles, u, k, and then you'd add all the other cases, which would be, or equivalently, a better way of saying it, whoops, I shouldn't have done that. 3, u, k, you do a sum of these unitary operators, the unitary operators that physically implement the permutation alpha, and then normalize by 1 over, I think it's 1 over square root of n factorial, but I don't know. Anyway, anyway, you want to normalize it somehow. And so this physical operator will do the permutation, but when it does the permutation physically, it gives you the, it would, I believe, give you the correct sign. And so you get alternating signs for, in other words, it gives you the same rule as the rule up there. But as I say, actually deriving that for every case is another matter. Now, suppose we have identical bosons. So then what we're left with is, if we had bosons, this operator u would always give the plus sign. And so you have just a linear combination of all the different permuted states. And what you'd say then is that the state effectively would have then, let us say, in one states, in other words, you could rewrite it as 1 u1, 2 u1, up to n1. Suppose the original state you started with was this. And then you'd have, well, you'd really have n1 plus 1, comma, n1 plus n2, this one in, this one in u2, all these in u2, and so forth. And you'd say then that there were n1 bosons in state u1, n2 bosons in state u2. And you'd write that in this occupation number representation. So it would be n1 bosons in state 1, n2 in state 2, n3 in state 3. And this particular thing then would be, you could either write it in this way, or you could write it in the mathematical way. But it would be a sum over all the, either all the permutations on the original state 1, u1, up to this huge number. Again, you have to normalize it. Or, I guess you could write it as these physical unitary operators. For the case of fermions, what's the maximum value of n, of this n1 or n2? All right, well, let's think about it. The point is that you see, suppose you wanted to put both particles at point 1, at the same place, with the same spin. Then what you would have would be x plus, say, x plus. You'd have that plus this unitary operator on x plus, x plus. But that would give you just x plus, x plus, minus x plus, x plus. And that's zero. 
So you can never have two fermions in the same state. And so that's a result of that? That's just a result of being in identical? Being identical fermions. The Pauli exclusion principle. That's the Pauli exclusion principle. Another way of saying it is, I mean, a conventional way of saying it would be that you use your anti-symmetrizer on the state side. And this would be a sum then of P alpha times epsilon alpha on the state. And if you permuted two particles that were in the same state, then you wouldn't change the state, but you'd have a minus sign due to the parity of the permutation. And that would give you zero. Now, in particular, these observables, as I said, because the particles are identical, the observables are symmetric under the permutations of the particles and the particle numbers. And so in the time evolution, if you start out with a state that is completely symmetric or completely anti-symmetric, as you must for n-identical bosons or fermions, the thing stays symmetric because, let's see, maybe I should do a sort of description of it. These are indistinguishable and identical, right? Indistinguishable and identical is the same. We use it for the same, it means the same thing in physics. Now, whether that's the best way of doing it, I don't know. Okay, suppose we have the symmetrizer E to the minus IHT on some state psi. And suppose this state psi was already symmetrized. So in other words, in other words, is this state equal to E to the minus IHT psi? And in fact, what I want to say is I want to put another S there. And in fact, it is because, first of all, the symmetrizer is used for the Hamiltonian. And that's because the symmetrizer is the sum of all the permutation operators, apart from an overall constant. And the permutation operators commute the Hamiltonian. So if we start with a symmetrized state, then we can move the S through. And so this is equal to E to the minus IHT. Actually, I didn't want to write that. I wanted to write this. It's E to the IHT S squared psi. But now S squared is equal to S. And so let's just see why that's the case. S squared is 1 over N factorial sum P alpha 1 over N factorial sum P, say, beta. And so this gives us 1 over N factorial squared sum P alpha P beta. And actually, a better way of saying it is that the symmetrizer, well, the symmetrizer squared is 1. We've essentially seen that. We have seen it over here for the case of 
Well, maybe I should. Let me, let me just show you this with the case of two particles where it's easy to see that it's true. It's a little bit less easy to see that it's true in the general case. So um, S squared here is um, one half, one plus P21, a half, one plus P21. And this gives us a quarter, one times one is one, P21 times P21 is one. And then we get two P21. And so this is a half, one plus P21, which is S. So here S squared is equal to S. Um, over here, this P alpha, P beta is another permutation. Um, but these things form a group, and what, what you wind up doing here is you get all the permutations. You get each permute in this product over alpha and beta. You get each permutation n factorial time. So in other words, 1 over n factorial squared times the sum over gamma, p gamma, but this p gamma, and you get p gamma n factorial times. And so altogether, this is s. So that means that that means that this is e to the minus i h t s on the side. So in other words, we start out with if, if we have identical bosons, the physical state is s times psi, appropriately normalized. After time. We're asking, is it the same? Is it still a symmetrized state? And indeed it is, because what we've seen is that S on the state is equal to the original state. And so, so it's still a symmetric state. And um, on the other hand, we can do the same thing for the anti-symmetrizer.
a sign. So the anti-symmetrizer on the state has no effect, which means that the state is already anti-symmetric. Right, that's right. Notice that that's just a consequence of a squared equal to a. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that a permutation on the state, a transposition on the state, will give a minus sign. All right, I guess that's... Are there any questions? Actually, you asked several questions, and I didn't give you any chocolate. I'll take mine as well. All right, I have a question. Okay. And I forgot to give these things out. Does anybody want these? Okay, if I have an electron here, and it's been out, and another one here that's been out, I can tell them apart, right? Since they're... Yeah, because they say macroscopically apart, yeah. Okay, so if I put them in a well and cool it, and they get closer and closer, when can I no longer distinguish them? Well, it's the answer that is normally given is when the wave functions overlap, then you have to take into account that they're identical particles and anti-symmetrize them. When the wave functions don't overlap, you don't really need to consider them to be identical particles. And, in fact, you put your finger on it. It's when you say that... I mean, you started out by saying you have an electron here and an electron there. You can distinguish them. You can distinguish them by their position. So they're distinguished by their positions. If they're distinguished by their positions, then effectively they're distinguishable. But once the wave functions overlap, they're no longer distinguishable. Okay, so if we bring them in close and they still have the same spins, and now their wave functions are going to cancel? Or is one of them going to flip? The wave function has to be anti-symmetric in space if it's symmetric in spin. So let's try to think about what that means. Well, I'm saying, like, you have the example right there where you have... Let me just do it. It's phi of x1 psi of x2 minus phi of x2 psi of x1 times some normalization. Okay? So this is zero when x1 is equal to x2. But it doesn't mean... But when you say it's zero, does that mean that the wave function is canceling? Yeah, the wave function is actually zero when the two particles have the same coordinates. But you still have the mass energy for two particles? Huh? But you still have the mass energy for those two particles? Oh, for sure, yeah. There's still two electrons. What cancels is the wave function when... In other words, the wave function for two particles would be of this form. So you have some omega of x1, x2. It would look like that. I'm still a little confused. I mean, like, this says that if we have two electrons spin up and we get them close enough together, their wave functions will cancel. Right, so you can't get them... The probability of them being at the same spot is zero. Okay. But they can be close. And... Let me just emphasize something. Suppose you're talking about two hydrogen atoms. Okay. 
And what you conventionally do in a simple approximation due to Born and Oppenheimer is you treat the two protons, which are 2,000 times heavier as classical objects, and you treat the two electrons quantum mechanically. And you say that these two things are a fixed classical distance r apart. Well, then you know you have to have an anti-symmetric wave function with two electrons. But you have two choices. You can say that it's symmetric in spin and anti-symmetric in space, or anti-symmetric in spin and symmetric in space. And it turns out the correct answer for the ground state of hydrogen is symmetric in space and anti-symmetric in spin. So in this case, they kind of hug each other in the, in the center like that, but the spin, uh, the spin, uh, the spin, uh, I don't want to say wave function, but the spin state vector is anti-symmetric in spin. So it's plus, minus, 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 plus. That's the spin part, and the space part is symmetric. Symmetric meaning, of course, that it's this times. Uh, phi of uh, x1 psi of x2 plus psi of x1 phi of x2. So this thing multiplies that thing. So the, when they're both together there, that's... Yeah, the, the electrons in the case of a hydrogen molecule, and this is true for most of these molecules, general covalent bond, is the electrons crowd together as if they were bosons, but the spin is anti-symmetric. So okay. it's a spin singlet, but the electrons are crowding together. And notice what notice how this makes the thing a molecule. You have a big negative charge here, and then you have a plus charge here and a plus charge here. So the two positive charges are attracted to the electron cloud in the middle. What would okay, so what would it look like if it were, say, say the opposite? Anti-symmetric in space. Well, then you'd have... Is that like one... So I've never really had a good definition for this, this space symmetry, or at least a picture. Well, it might look like this. You have this one nucleus here, one nucleus there, and this guy would look sort of like this. It would look kind of like that. Okay. So they're they crowd. So when you say when okay. you when you go to the point in the middle, you ask what's the probability of the two electrons being in the middle? It's zero. Okay. And this gives you actually a higher energy state. I think it's a positive energy In fact, like I. I I will confess to you that when I first did some, I was playing around calculating the hydrogen atom, the hydrogen molecule, I thought that it was anti-symmetric in space and symmetric in spin. And I computed what the energy was would be using, I guess, a variational method. I kept getting an energy that was too high. And then finally, sort of like, you know, the Sherlock Holmes and Watson, when you Examined every reasonable case, true and unreasonable case. I chose the opposite and then it worked out. So, any more questions? All right, well, we have spring break coming up next week, so there's no class. And then uh, we'll start classes normally when the spring break is over. But then we have two makeup classes, and we have to think about what we're going to do about them. You might as well turn the thing off.